name is Corky Lee, and um, we are doing this uh, public reading of the Chinese Exclusion Act. The basic reason why this is being done is because uh, those of you who already know about the Chinese Exclusion Act, it's important to know the ramifications, and I uh, felt that reading the full act gives it uh, much more impact. Now, there's been a PBS documentary about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, there are quite a few things that are left out of that. Uh, also, since that was the, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act is not the uh, first piece of federal legislation that happened to Chinese. Uh, we have to go back about eight years to 1875 with the Page Act. And the Page Act basically prevented uh, Chinese women from entering the United States because there was a uh, presumption that all Chinese women coming in were prostitutes or would become prostitutes. All right? So, uh, that's 1875. Uh, four years later, in 1879, there was a bill before Congress that was called the 15 Passenger Act. And the 15 Passenger Act basically would fine uh, owners and captains of uh, ships bound for the United States that had more than 15 Chinese passengers. Now, it passed the Senate and it passed the House, but Chester A. Arthur, the same uh, president that signed uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act vetoed it, all right? So that did not become law. But that didn't stop the forces of trying to uh, get Chinese excluded. So four years later, in 1882, the, uh, the infamous, uh, and I call it uh, dastardly racist uh, legislation uh, took place. And it was uh, around for over uh, 60 years. And uh, pretty soon, uh, uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, will be the uh, 75th anniversary of the repeal. And the repeal only came about because China and the United States were allies during the Second World War. However, there's much more of a backstory to that because within six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, the United States, under the command of uh, Major Jimmy Doolittle, flew over Japan to firebomb uh, industrial cities in Japan. Now, Militarily, it was not a success, but it was a big morale booster to the um, American forces here. However, because the bombers took off from airplanes, now you got to uh, remember all the aircraft have fighter jets, okay? But they had bombers on these airplanes, and they were spotted by the, the Japanese uh, a little too early. Uh, I think it was like a, a day or two before the, they took off. But the bombers couldn't land back on the aircraft carrier because you need more real estate to land a bomber or even a jet. They, well, you need more real estate to land a bomber than you do a, a, a fighter plane. So what they did was they flew over China and ditched their planes over China. And there was an agreement with uh, the Chinese and the Americans that the Chinese would harbor uh, the 80 uh, airmen that struck Japan. Now, of the 80, 75 were able to return to the United States safe and sound. So they only lost like five people out of 80. However, China uh, paid a very dear price. Now I've seen two figures. One figure was 25,000 Chinese were killed uh, as a result of them cooperating with the Americans. Another figure said 250,000. So if you believe at least you know, somewhere in between, maybe like 125,000 Chinese basically paid dearly. This was one of the uh, the back um, uh, stories when Madam Chiang Kai-shek came to the United States, spoke before Congress, uh, both houses of Congress. She was the first, uh, I believe she was the first woman, uh, the first Chinese to speak before Congress in uh, February of 1943. And it took until December 17, 1943 for this country to repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act. All right? So it actually took a lot of time. Uh, thank you, Corky. As Corky said, I'm Wei Wa Chin. I'm the president of uh, the Chinese American Citizens Lines of Greater New York. I want to uh, thank this whole gathering here, thanking, of course, Corky in particular for uh, spearheading this. He's been talking about this in, with, with great passion for this very important cause. And of course, I thank 21 Pell for hosting us here too. Uh, CACA, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, was formed actually in 1895 after the series. It's not one act, as Corky said, it was a series of acts against uh, the Chinese Americans uh, excluding us. 
And it, it took so many years to get this done. We are proud that, again, uh, our members, Cacagni members here, have uh, stood up to uh, put the resolution, actually, in the city council. So the uh, resolution 654, in commemorating the 75th anniversary of the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act, was actually um, uh, penned by one of our uh, Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Greater New York members uh, with me, and we got it to, uh, to uh, uh, Councilman uh, Member Holden, and we've added Peter Ku and uh, Margaret Chin and Drum and, and Valone, a n number of other people to support this because I think it's important in this city of uh, the greatest number actually of Chinese Americans in the entire country, it is beholden on us to remember this. And it is not just a matter of looking back. It is a matter of looking forward, too, as to what we can do with the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act that we remember not to let this happen. Uh, we are facing right now Chinese Exclusion, a Chinese Exclusion Act of 2018 in education. And that is not right. As many of you know, uh, we have embarked, as Kakani is one of the plaintiffs against the mayor in his plan to discriminate against Asians, and that is not acceptable in 2018. We have to fight for the rights for us to be judged by our merit, our abilities, not by our race, not by our ethnic background, and that is what the Chinese Exclusion Acts were all about, and that's why we repealed it. So I, I encourage you to think about that as we go forward, that there are many issues that still remain with us. We want to look at the past, only in as much as it really projects us to do better and better for our community. And it's all of us. It's not just the Chinese Americans. It's not just the Asian Americans. It is all Americans here that we are trying to support in our effort to say that we are, are trying to include. We are not talking about exclusion against any one group because of their race and ethnicity. So with that, I again am uh, uh, thanking you all and saying that we at Kakani are extremely proud to be able to uh, be at this great reading of the Chinese Exclusion Act and to sponsor this with you. Thank you so much, Cordy. Well, we're happy here to represent uh, Abney, um, you know, we want to talk from uh, Kakagni, and uh, so I'm here from the Asian American Bar Association of New York. We're happy to sponsor this event because we understand the Chinese Exclusion Act as a law and how powerful the law can be in terms of affecting history, uh, showing where a country was at a certain point, and how we got to the repeal and the effects of that law on us today. I was talking to my wife earlier uh, about, hey, we're going to be talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act. And a lot of people, I think, think of it as history. And they, uh, they, uh, they'll ask, how does it affect me now? Why is it important? So if I could just talk for a couple of minutes about that. You know, the federal government in that era was hardly involved in immigration laws. It just wasn't, there was no custom borders patrol. You know, there was very few sort of federal government involvement in the borders. The borders were essentially open. And people that were coming were people from Europe. Uh, people from Europe that Americans thought would make good Americans. And uh, when the Chinese started coming, particularly in the West, that raised a problem within America because they did not see Chinese as proper people to become citizens of the United States. And that's why we have those laws that Corky was referring to right before the Chinese Exclusion Act. And part of that was an effort that, okay, the Chinese come here as laborers, that's okay. They're cheap, they're hard working, you know, we'll accept that. Uh, but Chinese staying, not really acceptable. Chinese having wives here and therefore having children and putting roots down, that was not acceptable. And all of those things led to the federal acts that preceded the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that's what the Chinese Exclusion Act was about. If they couldn't eject those people, if they wouldn't die, at least they would stay here and die off. They wouldn't be able to put down roots. If you think about our current president, his grandfather came to America in that same era. And he was able to do his business, put down roots, own property, make money. Think about what the Chinese Exclusion Act did to a whole group of people. It took opportunity away. They could not own property. They were always under the threat of expulsion, death. Their businesses faced enormous legislative pressure to close. So that's the you know, import of why the Chinese Exclusion Act and the laws around it really matter for us today, because they have effects on the population 
uh, today and sort of the opportunities that were gone. In many ways, it's hard to talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act because a lot of it is about negative space. It's about things that couldn't happen as a result. People couldn't be born, children couldn't be born, opportunities could not be created. So I think we need to understand the exclusion space as negative space. So we need to sort of really like, you know, understand that and understand the importance of that today. Because history is not always history, it's not even past. You know, the border, con border patrol in America in the federal level was created to exclude Chinese. So really the whole federal apparatus, in many ways, it was created, the first illegal immigrant was Chinese. So as we think, talk about the immigration issues today, we are intimately tied as Chinese Americans and Asian Americans to that experience. And so, you know, it's also tied to right now, who is an American? Because that's a debate that we're having again, and that's the debate that we're having then. So th all those reasons and more make the Chinese Exclusion Act and our memory of it and our memory uh, commemoration of the appeal really important. Thank you very much, Courtney. At this point, I just want to introduce the four people who are going to be doing uh, the act. Uh, to my right is uh, Ben Chan over here. Um, he's also a, a, a lawyer, and uh, he's uh, from uh, Asian American Bar Association. So to his left is uh, Barbara Chin. She's a member of the auxiliary of the uh, American Legion Post here in Chinatown, 1291. Uh, we have uh, Shirley Ng, who's a freelance journalist. Uh, and uh, she's going to be leading uh, the group in uh, karaoke uh, sing-along later on, okay? Uh, so, uh, despite the fact that uh, the, winter, uh, the, winter, uh, the, the weather is damp outside, we'll, we'll be cheerful inside. Uh, and finally, uh, Chinatown's uh, favorite son, uh, mystery writer, Henry Chang, I I'm actually blocking him, so. So, uh, so at this point, we'll start with uh, Henry uh, with the uh, reading of the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. I mean, Ben, I'm sorry. Uh, I went to law school, passed the bar exam uh, and everything. But much, much to the horror of my parents, I'm not currently an attorney. Uh, so I have no title, which is fine. <laughs> Transcript of Chinese Exclusion Act, 1882. An act to execute certain treaty stipulations relating to Chinese. Whereas, in the opinion of the government of the United States, to the coming of Chinese laborers to this country endangers the good order of certain localities within the territory thereof, therefore, being enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that from and after the expiration of 90 days, next after the passage of this act, and until the expiration of 10 years next after the passage of this act, the coming of Chinese laborers to the United States be and same is hereby suspended. And during such suspension, it shall not be lawful for any Chinese laborer to come or have so come after the, ex after the expiration of said 90 days to remain within the United States. Section two, that the master of any vessel who shall knowingly bring within the United States on such vessel and land or permit to be landed, any Chinese laborer from any foreign port or place shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor, and on conviction thereof shall be punished by a fine of not more than $500 for each and such and every such Chinese laborer so bought and may be imprisoned for a term not exceeding one year. Section 3 that the two foregoing sections shall not apply to Chinese laborers who were in the United States on the 17th day of November 1880, or who shall have come into the same before the expiration of 90 days next after the passage of this act, and who shall produce to the United States to such master before going on board such vessel, and shall produce to the collector of the port in the United States at which the vessel shall arrive, the evidence here and after in this act required of his being one of the laborers in this section mentioned, nor shall the two foregoing sections apply to the case of any master whose vessel become being bound to a port not within the United States shall come within the jurisdiction of the United States 
by reason of being in distress or in stress of weather or touching at any port of the United States on its voyage to any foreign port or place, provided that all Chinese laborers bought on such vessel shall deport with the vessel on leaving port. Section 4. That for the purpose of properly identifying Chinese laborers who were in the United States on the 17th day of November 1880, or who shall have come into the same before the expiration of 90 days next after the passage of this act, and in order to furnish upon them with the proper evidence of their right to go from and come to the United States, of their free will and accord as provided by the treaty between the United States and China dated November 17, 1880, the collector of customs of the district from which any such Chinese labor shall depart from the United States shall in person or by deputy go on board each vessel having on board any such Chinese laborers and cleared or about to sail from his district or foreign port and shall on such vessel make a list of all such Chinese laborers which shall be entered in registry books to be kept for that purpose in which shall be stated the name, age, occupation, last place of residence, physical marks of the particularities, and all such facts necessary for the identification of each such Chinese laborers, which books shall be safely kept in the custom house, and every such Chinese laborer so departing from the United States shall be entitled to, and shall receive free of charge, or cost upon application therefore, from the collector of his deputy, at the time such list is taken, a certificate signed by the collector of his deputy and attested by his seal of office in such form as the Secretary of Treasurer shall prescribe which certificate shall contain a statement of the name, age, occupation, last place of residence, persona description, and such and facts of identification of the Chinese laborer of whom the certificate is issued, corresponding with said list and registry in all particulars. In case any Chinese laborer, after having corresponding with said list and registry in all particulars, uh, in case any Chinese laborer, having received such certificates, shall leave such vessel before her departure, he shall deliver his certificate to the master of the vessel and if such Chinese laborers shall fail to return to such vessel before her departure from port, the certificate shall be delivered by the master to the collector of customs for cancellation. The certificate herein provided for shall entitle the Chinese laborer of whom the same is issued to return and re-enter the United States upon producing and delivering the same to the collector of customs of the district at which such Chinese labor shall seek to re-enter, and upon delivery of such certificate by such Chinese labor and the collector of customs at the time of re-entry in the United States, said collector shall cause the same to be filed in the custom house anti-duly canceled. Section 5. That any Chinese laborer mentioned in Section 4 of this act being in the United States and desiring to depart from the United States by land shall have the right to demand and receive free of charge or cost a certificate of identification similar to that provided for in section four of this act to be issued to such Chinese laborers as may desire to leave the United States by water. And, is, and it is hereby made the duty of the collector of customs of the district next adjoining the foreign country to which said Chinese labor desires to go to issue such certificate free of charge or cost upon application by such Chinese laborer and to enter the same upon registry books to be kept by him for the purpose as provided for in section four of this act. Section six that in order to the faithful execution of Articles 1 and 2 of the treaty in this act before mentioned, 
every Chinese person other than a laborer who may be entitled by said treaty and this act to come within the United States and who shall be about to come to the United States shall be identified as so entitled by the Chinese government in each case. Such identity to be evidenced by a certificate issued under the authority of said government. Which certificate shall be in the English language or if not in the English language, accompanied by a translation into English, stating such right to come, and which certificate shall state the name, title, or official rank, if any, the age, height, and all physical peculiarities, former and present occupation or profession, and place of residence in China, of the person to whom the certificate is issued, and that such person is entitled conformally to the treaty in this act mentioned to come within the United States. Such certificate shall be prima facie evidence of the facts set forth therein and shall be produced to the collector of customs or his deputy of the port in the district in the United States at which the person named therein shall arrive. Section seven that any person who shall knowingly and falsely alter or substitute any name for the name written in such certificate or forge any such certificate or knowingly utter any forge or fraudulent certificate or falsely personate any person named in any such certificate shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction thereof shall be fined in a sum not exceeding $1,000 and imprisoned in a penitentiary for a term of not more than five years. Section eight, that the master of any vessel arriving in the United States from any foreign port or place shall at the time he delivers a manifest of the cargo, and if there be no cargo, then at the time of making a report of the entry of the vessel pursuant to law, in addition to the other matter required to be reported, and before landing or permitting to land, any Chinese passengers deliver and report to the collector of customs of the district in which vessels shall have arrived a separate list of Chinese passengers taken on board his vessel at any foreign port or place, and all such passengers on board the vessel at that time. Such lists shall show the names of such passengers and if accredited officers of the Chinese government traveling on the business of that government or their servants with a note of such facts and the names and other particulars as shown by their respective certificates and such lists shall be sworn to by the master in the manner required by law in relation to the manifest of the cargo. Any willful refusal or neglect of any such master to comply with the provisions of this section shall incur the same penalties and forfeiture as are provided for refusal or neglect to report and deliver a manifest of the cargo. Section eight, that before any Chinese passengers are landed from any such line vessel, the collector or his deputy shall proceed to examine such passenger, comparing the certificate with the list and with the passengers, and no passenger shall be allowed to land in the United States from such vessel in violation of law. That every vessel whose master shall knowingly violate any of the provisions of this act shall be deemed forfeited to the United States and shall be liable to seizure and condemnation in any district of the United States into which such vessel may enter or in which she may be found. That any person who shall knowingly bring into or cause to be brought into the United States by land and who shall knowingly aid or abet the same or aid or abet the landing in the United States from any vessel of any Chinese person not lawfully entitled to enter the United States shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and shall, upon conviction thereof, be fined in a sum not exceeding $1,000 and imprisoned for a term not exceeding one year that no Chinese person shall be permitted to enter the United States by land without producing to the proper office of customs the certificate in this act required of Chinese persons seeking to land from a vessel. And any Chinese person found unlawfully within the United States 
shall be caused to be removed therefrom to the country from whence he came by direction of the President of the United States and at the cost of the United States after being brought before some justice, judge, or commissioner of a court of the United States and found to be one not lawfully entitled to be or remain in the United States. Section 13. That this act shall not apply to, dip to diplomatic and other officers of the Chinese government traveling upon the business of that government whose credentials shall be taken as equivalent to the certificate in this act mentioned and shall exempt them and their body and household servants from the provisions of this act as to other Chinese persons. Section 14. That hereafter no state court nor court of the United States shall admit Chinese to citizenship and all laws in conflict with this act are hereby repealed. Section 15. That the words Chinese laborers, wherever used in this act, shall be construed to mean both skilled and unskilled laborers and Chinese employed in mining. Approved May 6, 1882. Just so that you should know that the Chinese of this period did not just sit back and say, oh, well, that's how it is. You know, we're not going to speak out about it because most of us don't speak English, don't write English. So just so that you should know, there were people here who spoke out and fought back. One of them was a man who many considered to be the first Chinese American, who spoke English, wrote English, started a newspaper here in English, and protested these exclusion acts. And his name was Wang Chin Fu. And in 1993, some 10 years after the Exclusion Act, he spoke before Congress to challenge the Exclusion Acts and to challenge the man who sponsored them. And so before Congress, he spoke and said, we represent and speak for the 150,000 Chinamen in this country who are no longer immigrants, but bona fide residents of the United States, Chinamen who have resided here 10, 20, and 30 years, Chinamen who have had their families and their business interests in this country, who understand and abide by its laws, who have a considerable extent been educated in your schools and converted to your religion, who are opposed to the Gary Bill, not only because it requires of them impossibilities and puts upon them cruel and unusual punishment, but because it classes them with thieves and criminals. It requires them to be photographed precisely like criminals and to furnish witnesses who saw them land here from 10 to 40 years ago. We do not ask for favors. We appeal for simple justice. Our ambassador here in Washington, though he is a Chinaman, mingles in your best society, receives and is received by them, and yet the very people whom he represents, many of whom are wealthy, cultured, and refined, and who pay into the treasury of the United States millions of dollars annually, we are branded and classified under the provisions of this obnoxious bill as criminals, simply because we are persons of Chinese birth. Is this what you desire? Is this the best enlightened opinion on modern justice? Is it then a crime to be a Chinaman? Shall I be dragged from my bed at midnight because I shall refuse to be photographed? No, I will not be photographed against my will like a criminal. I will be hanged first. Why should we be made the subjects of discrimination, of indignity, of aversion, and proscription? And this was the voice of one man who spoke up in 1893. So if you can imagine that, this is the kind of voice we need today. We need people to speak up against what is going on in Washington, and now they're trying to round up Cambodians and Vietnamese, and they're sending them back for 
if you didn't report your library card 20 years ago, you're, you're out of here. So it's important, people reading here today, and it's important that we all be aware of this and fight back and resist. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please stand up and take a bow. One of the things that had happened during that time period, the Long Kun Fu uh, did not be photographed. The only other people that uh, had to carry photo IDs were convicted criminals and prostitutes. Um, you're going to have to let that sink in uh, as we uh, go forward with the uh, Christmas uh, sing-along. So um, we have to turn the other cheek, I guess. Thank you for being with us.